Okay, that might be a good sign. Okay, so the, the session this evening is Vertical Story Slicing Takes the Cake. And everybody had a chance to meet one another, hopefully, or at least meet at least one new person this evening. So I'll just take a quick second and introduce myself. My name is Kim Peremsky, and I am a principal consultant with a management consulting company called Applied Frameworks. Some of you may know our CEO, Jason Tanner. He uh, was originally supposed to present tonight. He's a resident of Cary and a member of this forum. And he wasn't able to be here, so he asked if I would be willing to come and speak with all of you. So I happily made the trip from my home in Charleston, South Carolina, to be here tonight. And I'm happy to report that I'm celebrating 10 years of agility after many years of not being an agile. Uh, starting my agile journey at a company called ING Direct, uh, which is no more, that was then bought out uh, by Capital One. And, and then I uh, subsequently moved on to Benefit Focus in Charleston, all companies that have gone through big agile transformations. So uh, I'm now with Applied Frameworks and hoping to impart some of that on other companies. I've earned some certifications along the way. I'm currently a certified Scrum Practitioner or CSP with both a, a Product Owner and Scrum Master concentration. Um, I'm a, a safe program consultant, and the next leg of my journey is I'm working towards my uh, CST, or Certified Scrum Trainer, through the Scrum Alliance. So enough about me, though. I'm actually here to talk about all of you uh, and the challenges that you're potentially facing with your various teams in trying to build and create good, sound stories. And if your experience is anything like mine, you've probably heard phrases from your team such as, this story's too big. I have an idea. Let's go ahead and create one story and we'll put that in this sprint and that'll be for development. And then we'll create another story and we'll put that in the next sprint and that'll be for testing. Happens all the time. Um, I've actually heard of teams that just change their sprint cadence. Oh, we have a lot of work this sprint. We'll go from two weeks to three weeks and, and do it that way. Uh, I've seen teams struggle with a lot of stories in progress, but they can't complete any of them because they're all reliant on one another and this one needs that to be finished and so they just end up in this tangled web, basically. I've looked at stories and said, I can't tell the difference. I don't know this acceptance criteria is the same as this acceptance criteria. What's the difference? What are we actually trying to do with this story? And of course the big one, carry over to the next sprint. Uh, it's always a struggle to see teams not able to meet their sprint commitments, carry it over to the next sprint, or even worse, just put it back into the backlog because they've missed a big market timing event and now it's, it's kind of for naught. So, uh, so that's a big one as well. I've seen struggle, uh, struggles that product owners have where they're looking at a list of stories and they cannot prioritize their backlog. They're thinking about it in terms of what they need to deliver for their client and they're like, they're all equally important. I can't possibly prioritize one over the other. And the struggle that product owners have with trying to write acceptance criteria or accept a story as done with folks on the team who are tasked with testing a story that can't test it because they, it's too technical and they truly don't understand what the story is trying to deliver. So I don't know if your experiences are similar to mine, but I hear these and many other scenarios. And whenever I do, I try to redirect teams back to the basics, which is invest criteria. Has anyone heard of this acronym before? Okay, good. So it's a, it's a relatively common acronym. I certainly didn't create it. It was actually created uh, very intentionally by a gentleman by the name of Bill Wake. He lives uh, up the road a bit in Virginia. And he actually has a blog out on the web uh, that I had read where he talks about how he went through the process of coming up with this acronym so that he could identify words that truly uh, you know, embodied what a good story structure would be but also would make a word that made sense to people that the teams could remember. And so there really is a lot of truth to this acronym. Now these words might spell invest but hopefully if you're like me your eyes are drawn to the word valuable, because if the story does not add value, then it's not a good story to begin with, right? So it really starts there. So you can't start invest with a V, so it's stuck there in the middle, but my eyes go right to that. Secondly, you need your story to be independent. It needs to be able to stand on its own and be vertically sliced. And that's gonna be the focus of a lot of our discussion and practice this evening. 
You also need stories to be negotiable and to some extent negotiated. And by negotiable, I mean that you have to have enough detail for your teams to understand what value they're trying to deliver and what the customer ultimately wants, but not so rigid that there's no room for exploration and discovery and creativity and, and changing things to truly get the most value out of the story. So you don't want it to be too rigid. Negotiated in the sense that when you have a valuable independently sliced story, a product owner can look at that and negotiate whether that needs to go up in the backlog, down in the backlog, or just move it out because it's not needed. It needs to be estimable. By estimable, it does not mean the one engineer on the team that actually knows what the story means. It means that the entire team needs to have a shared understanding of that story. They need to understand the value that's being delivered. They need to understand what role they, as a team member, play in being able to deliver that story. So if that shared understanding isn't there, it can't be estimable. A story needs to be small. Some people would say the S stands for uh, sized right, because you can also apply this you know, to epics and features and so forth. But in the case of a story, small means it has to fit within a sprint, not an ever-changing cadence of a sprint either. Uh, and ideally, it doesn't take up the whole sprint. Right? It just takes up a day or two, because you want to constantly have that sustainable pace. And lastly, your story needs to be testable, because you have to be able to validate that story, it needs to be objectively validated. And that's where we get into the situation of the product owner that doesn't know what the story even is. I have seen many times product owners accept stories as done on blind faith because the engineer said it was done. And that's not a testable story. So the way that we get to this invest criteria, well actually, before we get there, I should mention the advantages of it, right? So when you have a solid, structured story that follows the invest criteria, you eliminate a lot of that confusion and miscommunication, the bottlenecks, you don't have all of this half-done code, you don't have all of the carryover, and then you have a team that's able to be more creative, truly focus on the value, they all feel like they're involved, they understand what they're delivering, they're shipping faster, things are more consistent, and wow, what does that do for morale? When you have a team that understands their purpose in life, essentially, they're all working together, they're collaborating, they're delivering on time, they're seeing their results in production, what does that do to morale? It's, it's a great feeling. And so that team moves from just being handed specs and asked to deliver to actually delivering value. And it allows them to move away from just focusing on a solution that may have been prescribed for them to focusing on what is the goal that we're trying to achieve here, not what somebody else told me I needed to implement. So those are the advantages of a, a good story that follows this criteria. And the way we get there is through vertical story slicing. This is what allows us to have independent stories that are small and valuable and estimable and all of those qualities. So a vertical story slice is a cross section through the layers of the code base that form a fully functional feature. So this is a very simplistic example. This is the, the layer cake analogy that was also uh, created by Bill Wake. And you can see here you have your UI and your UX layer, you've got your service or middleware layer, you have your data layer, and there's lots of other layers that, that go into that stack. And so the idea is that you're taking a cross-sectional slice through that entire stack. And that's how you're getting to that independent, valuable piece of delivery. Now, in my opinion, conceptually, this is pretty easy. But like Agile, it's very difficult to actually implement. Because you have folks on a team who are accustomed to working in their respective areas of expertise. And so what we're asking them to do is to flip things kind of on its head a little bit. And that was also why I asked you know, who in the room were product owners and scrum masters and so forth, because I typically have these conversations with product owners, and we talk a lot about this. And it takes a while sometimes for folks to get it, but then even when the product owners understand it and they start to 
slice the stories in a more vertical way and they bring them to backlog refinement with the team, they get met with a lot of resistance because the team wants to work this way. And so they're, they're talking to the product owner like, you don't know what you're talking about. We can't do stories like this. We have to have them this way. This doesn't make any sense. We have to have all of our, our you know, databases built out first. We have to, you know, all of the, those different layers. And so it becomes a real struggle for the product owner because they feel like they're on an island because they're trying to truly focus on the value and how we can get things delivered valuable to the client the fastest way possible. And the team isn't supportive of that or just doesn't quite understand how to get there. No, no, I'm just saying that, that these, are, these are, if you created a story that said, build out d the database table to support X, Y, Z, that would be what we would consider a horizontal story, not a vertical story. But if that database table were, was needed to build out a piece of functionality for the, the end user, then you would want that database uh, story is really a task. So that story would be, you know, I want to deliver X functionality for this customer, which includes the UI, the middleware, and the database to support all of that. So it also makes an assumption that the team is cross-functional, right? It does make that assumption um, to some degree, but even teams that aren't fully cross-functional, they can still create tasks within those stories, and then it's a matter of being able to manage the dependencies across those teams. But that, that's more and more the argument for having a cross-functional team, absolutely. Yep. So, um, so how do we actually achieve vertical story slicing? Well, there are some patterns, and that's what I mostly want to focus on with you guys tonight. So again, these are the patterns. Uh, I feel like the patterns themselves are not that difficult for the most part to understand once you're introduced to them. There's lots of articles and blogs and books where you can go and read up on all of these patterns. So what I want to focus on tonight is really the harder part, which is practicing it, putting it into practice, thinking about it intentionally. So uh, what we're going to do is kind of do a, a fast pace through some slides with each of these patterns. We're going to just talk about them really, really quickly. And then we want to get into some activities where we can actually practice this a little bit and see what we come up with. So. Um, I'm going to need your help to fill in the titles of each one of the slides. Now, if you have a photographic memory, <laughs> you, you have quite an advantage because all the answers were on that slide that I just showed you. Okay, so there's, there's a hint there. Um, please don't make me feel like that professor from Ferris Bueller standing up there going, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. So just feel free to shout out an answer once you feel like you know what goes in that, that first slide. So we'll take a stab at, at this first one. Does anybody know what goes in that, that first one? Workflow, yay, okay. Oh, good, I don't feel like that professor. <laughs> okay, I was gonna feel really silly. So we're gonna, um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about workflow. I do feel like work, the workflow pattern is probably the more complex of all of the patterns to really get it right, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but as we go through each of these workflow slide examples, I'm just gonna use you know, a standard online retailer as our example, you know, a typical Amazon type example, which is easy enough for all of us to relate to. So if, if I were Amazon, I would <coughs> have a workflow that I go through to be able to get to the point of ordering an item and having that order process. So first I start off by adding something to my cart, entering my billing address, my shipping address, payment, and so forth, all the way through to processing the order. And so one of the ways that we can split out stories is by looking at what process we're trying to build out and identify the steps to get from point A to point B and slice the stories vertically that way. So in that regard, add to cart might be a story. Enter billing address might be a story. You could potentially even break those down and we'll get to that. Now, where I feel like workflow gets a little bit more complex is that, and I, I don't wanna uh, confuse folks too much, but there are, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can slice a story by workflow. So there is a gentleman, uh, a consultant out there by the name of Richard Lawrence, and he's written quite a few articles and blogs and so forth on vertical story slicing. So I encourage you to go out and read what he has. He's got some great material out there, and I have some links at the end of the slideshow that, that link to some of his things. So he actually maintains that, okay, 
Great, so you, you have a story for add to cart. Is that really adding value though? Well, yes and no. I, I think to some degree it is because I can certainly go into a sprint review and say here's, here's how we're proposing that we build out and how a customer is going to add items to their cart. So I think to some degree there is value in splitting it out that way. But what Richard Lawrence maintains is that the real value to the customer is being able to process their order. So he actually says, all right, not only do you slice it out by workflow, but then you take and you slice through that and you come up with either the shortest path to get from adding to a cart to processing your order, or so you might eliminate some middle steps or you just take a very thin slice all the way through. Now, so again, I don't want to complicate the discussion. I personally fully agree with him, but I feel like that's like the advanced level. Given that I see so many teams slicing their stories horizontally, I feel like if we can get folks to even be thinking along these lines of just let's focus on being able to add something to a cart, let's focus on being able to enter the billing address, I think that's a huge win for teams. I feel like that's almost the training wheels of this workflow pattern. So again, I encourage you to go ahead and read up on it. That's probably the, the most complex one of all. All right, so moving on to the next one. Anybody want to take a guess at what might go in here? The examples that I give from our online retailer are shipping to a single address versus shipping to multiple addresses. So one is, right, and the other is? Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> OK, so you're catching on. You don't even need me up here. All right, so pattern number three. We have a blank there. Uh, and we are going to process transactions in states that don't collect sales tax versus states that do. Anybody want to guess the missing word? Excellent. Yes. So fairly simple pattern, thinking about the different rules that you have to, uh, to implement. OK, so now we have this little bit of a fuzzy picture here of a tree. But you can see that you've got the, the major trunk with the, the three big branches spinning off of that. And I believe uh, that the, the answer to this one is probably hidden in the words of this slide somewhere. Uh, but anybody want to take a guess at what goes in that line? Begins with an M. Major. Major effort, exactly. So the idea with this one is that these examples, add items to shopping cart, add items to wish list, compare similar products, these are all separate and distinct things. But one of them is going to have to take the hit. One of them is going to have to take on more of the work. So I would venture to guess that if I were to focus on adding items to the shopping cart, then I would gain a lot of insights. I would learn a lot of things along the way as I'm writing that code. And I would probably be able to leverage a lot of the work that I've done for adding items to shopping cart to then do the wish list functionality. So it's kind of taking a look at the big things, figuring out which one needs to take the heavy hit, and then using that kind of as your foundation to then focus on these other ones. So the idea being that not necessarily trying to work on all three of these things at once, because again, you're going to get yourself into a bit of a quagmire. The next pattern, our standard CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. Or, to say it a little bit differently, add item to cart, view cart, remove items from cart, and so forth. So we call these the CRUD. Excellent. Slicing by operations. So again, another, another pattern that you can employ. This, the picture probably gives this next word away. Uh, we have the examples of showing shipping dates for customers with membership versus customers without. Maybe mm -hmm. Amazon Prime versus non-Amazon Prime customers. Anybody know what goes in that? Data. Data, exactly. So you're taking a look at the data that you have. And again, we'll practice more of this. Oh, this is a hard one. We have three blank spots. So we need lots of participation on this one. So if I were to say, as a customer, I would like to be able to do XYZ functionality on my mobile device, my tablet, or my PC, those are examples of? Think, think I. You're close. You're close. 
It's actually interfaces, right? And then somebody said platforms. So that would be like iOS, Android. So yes, it's all, somebody was probably remembering that first slide that I had up. And then lastly, if I want to do something as a buyer versus a seller, an approver versus a requester, those are different types of roles. Excellent, yeah, so be thinking about the roles that your system's using. Okay, and then we have all of these different, what we call non-functional requirements, performance, logging, UI, browser compatibility, usability, and so forth. Anyone wanna guess the missing word there? These are all qualities of the system, exactly. Now this is not to say that these are less important. Everybody likes to shove you know, the non-functional requirements under the rug, uh, and, and that's not what we're implying here. But if your goal is to get a proof of concept out the door just to see you know, if it's palatable and usable uh, by the client or your end user, you don't necessarily need to be worried about performance or logging at that point. So those are the types of things that you can separate out into other stories because, again, the idea is that you're trying to inspect and learn and, and gain knowledge along the way because you don't want to start trying to optimize performance of something that isn't even really fully baked yet. Who remembers these diagrams? Do we still use these diagrams? Anybody know what this is a diagram of? No. Use cases. Yeah, use cases, exactly. These are use cases. So we have our actor, and we have, uh, he's trying to pay with a credit card, but we have some extensions to these use cases. His credit card might be expired, it might be declined. He might want to pay partially with a credit card and partially with some store credit that he has. So these are extensions of use cases or different scenarios. So in this case, if he's paying with a credit card and his credit card is expired, he's probably not a happy guy. Likewise, if his card is declined, he's also probably not a happy guy. So these are slicing by happy or unhappy paths, by use cases and scenarios. Okay, so that covers all the patterns really quickly. So I have a couple more, more uh, parting words before we get into some real practice here. So what I want to mention is that if you take a potential solution and you then use some patterns to break it out, doesn't mean you have to stop there. Just like fractions in grade school, if you have 50 over 100, you can continue to reduce and apply patterns until you get as small as you possibly can, till you get to one half. So be thinking about those invest criteria and being able to get as small as you can. So, to illustrate that, I provided an example here. Similar to Russian nesting dolls, where you can continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So if we take some of these examples from the prior slides, I started off with my workflow, and I decided that I was going to use the workflow pattern, and I was going to focus just on entering a billing address. So I'm not going to worry about all of those other workflow steps right now. We need to show something in our sprint review and we're gonna get this billing address functionality working. Because we believe that once we get the billing address working, the shipping address stuff's gonna be a lot easier. We're gonna be able to turn that around pretty quickly. So then I took the billing address story, and I said, well, but wait a minute, I can have billing addresses that are the same as my shipping address or that are different. So I used my variations in data pattern to then only focus on a billing address that is the same as a shipping address. Doesn't mean I don't have to do the other one to maybe get it into production and usable, but I can certainly start there, use those learnings to then apply it to that, that future story. So now I'm only worried about the billing address that's the same as the shipping address. But then I realize, well, wait a minute, I have domestic and I have international addresses that I could be shipping to. So I'm gonna apply my business rule variation pattern and I'm only going to focus right now on shipping to domestic addresses. And then lastly, I applied the simple versus complex pattern because maybe I eventually need to integrate with a third party vendor to do some address validation, but I'm not gonna do that right now. I just need to get something out there, something in front of my customers that I can start to get some feedback on and learn from. So I'm not gonna opt for that third party vendor right now. I'm gonna opt to do nothing at all, actually. 
And then maybe in a subsequent sprint, I might do some basic address validation where I just have a zip code lookup table or something. And so I'll, I'll continue to iterate along those lines. So that's, that's kind of how we, um, we want to think about these patterns and just thinking about how can we consistently make it smaller because each piece is still a valuable chunk that we can deliver and say, look what we have. You can play with this. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can put you know, things into the fields and, and give us feedback. A few more things, some clues to when you might want to break out some stories. So look for compound sentences. I need the system to do this and this and this or this, if this, then this. All of those keywords are triggers or clues that, hey, maybe I can break out some stories by, by looking at these compound sentences. Using the UI as a guide. So a lot of times we start with mock-ups. You know, are there different tabs? Are they stories? Sections on a screen, buttons on a screen. Could they all be separate stories? Maybe the previous and, and next or the save and cancel are really part of the same story, but the download to PDF, that could be its own thing. We don't need to worry about that right now. Error handling, this tends to fall into that happy, unhappy path pattern. Uh, the error handling is a rather easy one. A lot of times, it's very simple to just try to get the basic flow working. Let's assume that the user is entering all of the data correctly, and they don't have their credit cards not being declined, and all of these random things. We're just going to assume a, a happy path straight through. Let's make sure that works first. Let's get feedback on that, and then we can build in the warnings and the errors and all of that other validation. Must-haves and nice-to-haves, certainly a good one. Not only does that help you break out the stories, but it helps to prioritize the backlog as well, because you should always be putting those must-haves up at the top and those nice-to-haves down at the bottom. And then finally, technical voice. If you have a story that sounds very technical, it's probably written horizontally. So what you need to do is take that techie story and try to figure out, okay, well, what, what customer value is this technical story trying to ultimately get us to? Then that technical piece probably becomes a task. So you want to rewrite your story in the voice of the customer and then take all the patterns we talked about and figure out how to break it down from there. So those are some of your clues. All right, so I've been talking enough. So now I want to put you guys to work a little bit more. So on your tables, you actually have this handout. Um, there's some pens and markers. And uh, what I want you to do is work with the folks in your table. Um, in the case, uh, we have somebody sitting by themselves, so maybe the three of you guys work together. Um, but work together. These are all sample functional requirements that you know, somebody wants. And these are all the possible patterns on the right. And so I just want you to figure out what is the right answer and fill in the blank. So we're going to just take about a minute or so for this. Um, so just go ahead and if you don't get them all done, that's OK. Um, actually, maybe this, this, yeah. this side of the room, maybe you start at the top. And then this side of the room, uh, work from the bottom up. And then that way, as a, as a room, we'll get them all done. So we'll just take about a minute or so and do that. OK, so let's go ahead. We're going to do the, the big answer reveal here. Let's, let's see, uh, see how, how well we did. Uh, so uh, feel free to just shout out the answer, and we'll see where we are. So I want to create a quote for my customer on my laptop, my phone, or my iPad. G. G. Excellent. Variations in interfaces, <laughs> platforms, and roles. OK, how about uh, dental claims, viewing by the different time frames and seeing the different types of claims? F. 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 OK, yes, very good. Variations in data. OK, this next one's a little bit hard. I need to manage beneficiaries for my life insurance policy. So the key word here is manage. I tried to give you a hint. I'm going to take a guess at that one. D. Uh, so actually, I had operations, create, read, update, delete. So you're trying to manage something. Uh, I need to you know, manage my profile, for instance, on LinkedIn. I need to update my name. So that was a little bit of a, a trick one. I just wanted to see, see how well everybody could do. Um, how about predefined reports and ad hoc reports? 
Yeah, very good. Simple, complex. It's obviously a lot easier to create predefined reports and to try to do all the ad hoc ones. Mm -hmm. All right, how about sending files to a client, flagging files that failed, trying to do an automatic uh, retry afterwards? What do you think? I. I, I, I happy, happy, unhappy path. Very good. And, and then we have this content management system example where you want to basically do all these things. So I'm hearing different words. I had a D. Now, this is interesting because some of the, the things, so these I don't think were necessarily, they could be considered in a flow, not maybe written completely in a, in a flow. What you will find is some of these patterns may seem very similar. Like you might say like, well, is it variations in data or is it business rules? So don't get too hung up on that. Again, the, the focus is the value, right? So don't, as long as you're trying to think about patterns intentionally and, and doing that to get to that invest criteria, don't get hung up on, well, is it business rules or is it data? Because uh, some of them I do feel like are very similar. OK, now uh, this next one um, kind of sounds like maybe what some people called out before, where they want to be able to initiate an expense report, add expenses, add receipts, and then submit. So Workflow, workflow right. And then we have the example of the applicant is a smoker. If the applicant is a smoker, the system should prompt to complete a tobacco addendum. Yes, business rules. And then lastly, the system needs to log all user events in transaction history. H, deferring system qualities. OK, so I think we're making some good progress here. So now comes the, the, the real hard part, but hopefully sort of fun. So I guess the first thing I want to do is ask, did anybody by any chance bring any examples with them that knew what the content of the, this presentation was and said, I have a problem at my work? And if anybody has that, um, they can feel free to share that with their group. But otherwise, I did come prepared with a few sample systems that, you know, I'm coming in and I'm, I'm a client. I, I want this team to build this system. So I have three different examples. And what I'd like to do is break the room into some small groups. And we're going to read the example here and just do our best at trying to break down some stories write them on the sticky notes using the markers provided. I can give, give you some more markers if you need them. But you, know, um, you can maybe have one scribe at your table or however you want to do it. Use the invest criteria. So write your stories. And then at the bottom of the sticky note, though, try to notate which pattern you're trying to apply to get to that ultimate invest criteria. So we're going to do this in our small groups. Uh, we're going to take maybe about 20 minutes or so to do that. We'll see how everybody's doing. If we you know, get done more quickly, we can move on. Um, but we'll take about 20 minutes, practice it. When we get near the end of the time, I'll have you take your sticky notes and stick them up on the wall so that everybody can see them a little bit better. And I'm going to uh, count on someone to be a spokesperson for your team so we can do a little bit of a share out and, and learn from one another. So we'll do that. And, uh, and see what we come up with. And then we'll have a couple other things that we'll do, and, and then we'll wrap up. Everybody think they're ready? All right, I know you can do this. OK, so, um, so I'm thinking, let's see, how do we want to do this? I'm thinking like groups of about, let's see, how many people do we have? Four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 30, 14, 18, 19, So we have 25 people, so maybe like six teams. Does that sound about right? So we can do six uh, teams of four, and one team will just have an extra person. Does that sound like a plan? You guys can self-organize to that, maybe? OK, so you guys can take that example. And let's see here. How about while we're, while we're waiting for that group to finish up their, uh, their story sticking on the wall technique, um, <laughs> how, where are my, my flight? Um, s system or flight booking system teams. I think we had two of those, right? In the back. And did we have one more? Up here, right? OK. All right, great. So uh, we'll give the other folks in the room that didn't have that example a chance to read this slide, which was their scenario. And then uh, we'll have, um, have our two teams that did this system talk about what, uh, what they came up with. Um, so you're, you, you look really ready. So please introduce yourself to the group. Um, I'm Scott. 
Hi, Scott. We basically took this and broke it down. We started looking at, we started actually breaking up the sentences. Um, I can't remember what that was called now off the top of my head. Um, but the, where you're starting to look for complex sentences uh -huh. and stuff. So Compound sentences, doing yeah. That and just literally wrote it on the paper, piece of paper. Um, so for how we kind of broke things down, we've got our list of what the rules were and then what we actually did for each of them. Um, so for under business rule variations, we did ability to log in with the username and password. And then creating a profile. You created the profile, and then you have the ability to log in after that. Um, so we did that. Um, from a happy path perspective, you can view the options for one carrier with times and prices, and then you can view the options for multiple carriers with times and prices. It's kind of also business variations, but it, it allows for some flexibility to it there. Um, for simple and complex, there's a couple, several of these fall into that category actually, where we actually did search for specific time ranges for flights. And then search for specific price ranges for flights, and then search multiple cities in the same session. Um, for, from a workflow perspective, it doesn't seem to line up right anymore. No, no, no it's, it's, it all ties in. Anyway, so um, also with the simple and complex was adding the filters for the search results for for the airline, for price, and for the um, times. Those three all went together, um, and then adding filters for the time of day inside the search results as well. And then um, building beyond that is the ability to modify the search results inside that same page, trying to do that. Um, then we got into variations on data kind of things where we got into booking a one-way flight, and this, this is also kind of simple complex and happy path too, um, but booking a one-way flight, then booking a return flight from the same location as the incoming flight, and then booking multi, multiple city departures somewhere to anywhere else. Um, and then we also get into the ability to save an itinerary, and then we did a research bike for how often do prices change for airlines so that we could do the last one, so the notifications and stuff. Okay. So we kind of did it. Great job. We'll give them a hand. This, I said, this, is, this isn't, it's, in sim it's simple in theory, but it's hard in practice. Um, and I think you guys are seeing that, and it takes time. And so even as I was, was listening to you, I was like, well, oh, okay, I see how they could see where that would be broken down as simple, complex, um, or something. Uh, I think you had something else um, as simple, complex. But you know, for instance, the search results, you could also say, well, that's variations in data, because each thing that I want to search on is a different data element. And so I can continue to add over time. So I, I don't want folks to get hung up on a right way or a wrong way or, or get into a huge debate about which pattern in particular. The idea is that these are tools in your toolbox and you apply them. And sometimes you use the screwdriver as a hammer because you can't find your hammer, but as long as you're using something and not your hand, you know, we're better off. So just kind of think about it that way and don't get as hung up on the pattern itself. But the, the fact that you now have this knowledge and can use these different tools in your toolbox, you can start to apply them. And, you know, whether you debate if it's, you know, simple complex or variations in data or whatever it might be, you know, just either way you're trying to apply a pattern and use a tool to get you there. So great job. All right, how about you guys in the back? You, uh, you had the same example and, and I'm, I'm going to click forward on my slide because I, you know, I was also highlighting a few things that I think these guys touched on and let's see what, what you guys came up with. So why don't you introduce yourself real quick to the group. Nice to meet you. Okay. Um, so the first thing we needed, we wanted, the first thing we wanted was a, a one-way flight on predetermined, in a predetermined airline on a predetermined date. Everything's fixed to see if we can make that happen. That was our first story. The second was to, to do a round trip booking, same way, everything's fixed. And we started to, to expand from that. We could select travel dates, we could for one way or a round trip. Uh, we could then, we then went after and said, let's, let's, let's look at all the other airlines that are available besides the one that we've chosen. Mm -hmm. um, can select our destinations and arrivals, location cities. Um, then we, uh, what else can we do? We do what we can book, book a multi city flight. Uh, we can save our queries and, and use them uh, for later. We can filter by price, select different airlines for departure and return trips, save our itineraries, save multiple itineraries, and then receive notifications for price changes on our saved itineraries. Okay. It's, really, it's really interesting looking at it because there's lots of ways you can, you can 
can chop it up. You know, it's just amazing. There are. And, and, se and sequencing, too. So when you talk about the different ways to chop it up, what, what's the one guiding principle? If you think about the invest criteria, what, what did I say was the, the first and foremost? Focus on what's going to get the end user or the client the most value first. So if you do have that struggle and say, well, I could break it out this way or I could break it out that way, you know, use that value test to determine which way makes the most sense to do it. So excellent. Um, and I, uh, I actually got um, this example was just me basically trying to rewrite um, Google Flights. <laughs> so, uh, so when you think about it that way, Right? I mean, you don't, they, could, they could launch that without having multi-city. You know, even now, I don't think they show Southwest all the time. They might have just started that. Uh, so there's a couple airlines that they don't have on there now. So again, kind of taking that approach of one airline and then building on it. Excellent. OK, so our next example was um, a grocery delivery service. So who are my two teams that had those? OK, so we want to give everybody like 30 seconds to read the slide who wasn't uh, doing that particular one. Um, I'm not going to read it because it sounds almost like a run-on sentence, so better for you guys to just read it to yourselves. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there. OK, so who wants to go first? All right, why don't you introduce yourself to the room? Um, yeah, my name is Jerry Edwards, and I do agile training and coaching as an independent consultant. Uh, I do blogging. My website is agile, the number two, success.com, and I encourage you to go there and uh, read some of the blog. Excellent. Um, we kind of uh, did this almost a little bit like story mapping in some sense, mm -hmm. so that we sort of uh, the top thing is we want to choose our item, we want to manage a cart, we want to provide a way to pay, and uh, information on delivery, get it delivered. So uh, in terms, we then started looking for sort of the value, and uh, he had made the comment, the value was actually in being able to get something delivered to your house. So what would be the easiest way to basically do that? So choose an item, add it to a cart, pick a, a simple way, one of the payment options, say PayPal or whatever, and then our address, and then it, it would be delivered. Uh, there, but there's a lot of things they want. They want multiple ways of paying. They mm -hmm. want to make sure uh, it's delivered within a window. Uh, you obviously would want to do things like uh, uh, compare prices, uh, search for items you want to be able to save a profile so you don't have to uh, enter, enter things again, maybe remember things you've added previously. Again, there were several uh, payment uh, options that were that were there. Um, and so all of those you could break down. I don't know what the topic is, if it's complex, simple, complex, with different data variations or whatever, and basically try to prioritize those based on the value. The value. Mm -hmm. The operative word here, too, is you said they want a lot of things. They think they want a lot of things, right? right? So uh, that, that's what is so nice about this approach, is that when you start to deliver those incremental slices and they start to see what's working and, oh, well, we actually have enough now where we, we could actually do a production launch, even just with this. And then suddenly you do that launch and then they all of a sudden they realize, well, maybe we don't need all of this. I mean, the customers, they're really happy paying with PayPal. They don't necessarily need to pay you know, some other way. And so those are the types of discoveries that you gain and, and get from that, that iterative right. approach. So that just reading that to scan paper a few times and to use online a few times. Right. And to validate those a few times. Right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? OK. So we'll go on to the next team that had this example, and I'll, I'll pull up some of my, my uh, highlighted words that, that I had as well, um, see what, what some of our other groups came up with. So go ahead and introduce yourself to the room. Dan Parsons, I'm an agile coach. Uh, so we, we kind of looked at what well, well, first of all, we've got an epic here. And the epic is, is the sense of you know, the busy parent when they purchase groceries and household items. Mm -hmm. um, How do we then break, break down what we've got there 
we felt that well, we've actually got a series of features before we even get to the stories. And there's actually a workflow that you can apply to this as well. So first of all, you've got to go online, you've got to order it. You want to be able to sort your goods. Um, think of Amazon, for example. Um, you then want to go to the checkout. For, you don't want to go to checkout. Um, at checkout, you then want to start handling your coupons. Um, and then once you've finalized all of that, you'll then go and do your um, delivery, you'll schedule your delivery. And then you can get to the payment. So delivery, for example, could impact price. Um, so pay last. And then we've got some additional features here around being able to log in, um, user account management. Um, and then as uh, in one of the sentences there, you've got, I want to be able to use um, tablet, iPhones, etc. Web-based, so we actually felt that was a, a feature in itself, which could then be split down into various values. Start simple, go with the web-based, then add iPhone, then add Apple Watch, etc. Um, but focusing on on the ordering process, you know, we then started splitting that down into stories. So you want to be able to log into the web. Well, actually, you don't want to log in. You can actually go in there without logging in. But you know, you want to be able to search your items and find your items. Um, you want to be able to view them. Um, you want to be able to add quantity select multiple items, for example, um, sort multiple items, um, in, and then there's a, there's a mention here about value, you know, you want the system to tell you what's the best value, etc. So, and we didn't even finish there. I mean, you, mm -hmm. can, you can split this down even more. So right. That's, that's as far as we've gone. So, do, do folks in the room feel like a lot of times the teams just kind of focus on some of those bigger ones that say, okay, here's our story and we're going to try to cram as much in as we can. I mean, when you really start to get into it, you start to see so many different ways. Oh, I can break this down and break this down and break this down. And all of a sudden you've got this huge story mm -hmm. and then it's unmanageable. Exactly. So, um, yep. So yep. Okay. Great job. Awesome. We'll give our grocery folks a round of applause. Okay. So our last example was a benefits enrollment system. Um, this is, this is kind of a carryover from my, my former employer, Benefit Focus. Uh, so I, I kind of uh, stole a few ideas from them, perhaps, um, in a more generic way, if you will. But uh, so who were the teams that had this example? OK. So we'll give the other folks just a, a quick 10 seconds or so to read this example and make sure they understand it enough. It's another run-on sentence. Wow. <laughs> Chock full of stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, looks like you're going to present for us. Go ahead and introduce sure. yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick Smith. I'm a Scrum Master and Agile enthusiast. So, we were working on the benefits enrollment system. We had two story splitting techniques at the highest level. So, we had a couple different roles. It was the HR administrator as well as the employee. And then workflow steps, you know, like you did techniques. So, there's a, a handful of steps for a user to go through to make it through the overall enrollment process. And then beyond that, there were a couple of different examples of, what was it, major effort. So, right, there's a bunch of different types of plans that somebody would need to go through. So the, the whole set of workflow in there to view those, look at the different details. And then we also had the reports capability that we wanted to be able to offer for the HR That was sort of a high level. So we have the, the basic workflow laid out here for an actor to go through and select the different types of plans, select the different dependents and beneficiaries, and then go through the entire process all the way through submission. Excellent. So focusing on the workflow side of things. Good job. All right. Any questions for this team? No? All right. Team number two. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Introduce yourself. I'm John. Hi, John. I'm Scrum Master. Uh, I'm owner, uh, test engineer. I do all the time stuff. Okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, we kind of went with the workflow and happy math, and uh, we decided that we 
needed to know who the employee was. So um, one of the things that we identified as well, just in looking through, is a lot of the information is static. We know who all of our employees are. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated to gather all the other information in. So in the beginning, we just have a database with the employee names because um, we needed to display the plan options. Again, it's just static information that we're just loading in. So um, we made our employees single and so we didn't have to deal with all of the other complexities yet. Okay. Just to get us through our in slice. Uh, and we were only going to take medical in the beginning. So um, choosing the coverage was simple because it was just single. Uh, just the plan pricing would just be depending on uh, what the plans were. And then we have a way to confirm a selection, uh, submit the updates into the system, and then send the confirmation. So we tried to like keep it as, as basic as possible and you know, recognize that a lot of the information, especially early on, as long as we didn't draw in all of the other stuff, um, which we listed out to the side. Right. Uh, it would make it a little simpler to at least show, is this the right direction? Is this what you're looking for? Exactly. Right. Because you're not necessarily going to go to production and not cover the, the spouses and the children, or, or maybe that's your company's policy. But, uh, but assuming that you are, then you can't go to production with just covering the single person. But you sure as heck don't want to build out the entire system with all of the dependents and all of that, only to find that you know they're not happy with the UI, they're not happy with the approach, and so you can learn so much just from taking the employee through the system, just through medical, because you know dental and vision are gonna be very similar too. So once you get the one experience right, it's very easy to layer on the rest. But now you've discovered along the way, and it's you can be much more agile and apply those changes to the other slices. So great job. Let's give this team a round of applause. Okay, so I'm looking at our time and I know we're getting close. Um, I'm hoping you guys might be able to hang out for just a, another couple minutes because while I had you all sort of collaborating together, now I kind of want you to compete against each other with a game of Kahoot. Does everybody know how to play Kahoot? No? Okay. Oh, you're in for like, this is like a fourth grade, fifth grade treat. Um, my kids play this at school. Um, I actually, believe it or not though, uh, learned about this uh, when I was in SAFE training, uh, Scaled Agile training, uh, but it's pretty fun. So if you go out, you just take your mobile device, go out to a browser and just type in this URL. And then I'm going to um, pull up, there's a, it's gonna prompt you for a pin, so I'm gonna pull up uh, my thing here. To get it full screen. Okay. Oh, let me turn that music off. That music gets really annoying after a while. Hold on, I gotta figure out how to do it. <laughs> So this is the pin that you're being asked to put in, and then it's going to ask you for a nickname. Okay, there we go. Okay, so while, while everybody's getting in, basically uh, this is a, just a friendly competition. Uh, there's 10 questions in this quiz. The question's going to appear on the screen, and then there's going to be answer, an answer bank at the bottom with different shapes and colors, and then you're going to select the shape and color on your phone that best matches that answer. I should warn you that not only is it based on correct answers, but there's also a timed element in it. So the more quickly you respond, the better your score is going to be. And so we'll figure out at that point uh, who the real master is here. So uh, we'll give everybody a minute to get in and then we'll, we'll go ahead and get started playing the game. All right, we still waiting on some folks? Let's see, three, four, six. We have 17. Does anybody need help getting in? You do? Okay. Let's see. So, um, no, just go to um, HTTPS uh, kahoot.it. All right, does anybody else need help getting in? Uh, uh, it should just be kahoot.it. Yeah. 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 Let me try that. All right. Anybody else need help? Make sure that we 
Were you able to get in that way? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, there you go. Now you can put your pin in and put a nickname in. All right, and then we'll get started. I could turn on the corny music for a minute, I suppose, but <laughs> but better. I think the kids like it a lot better. So, <laughs> all right, are we ready? All right. Do you need another minute? You good? Everybody good? Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and get started then. Okay. Ten questions. Are you ready? I play this game. I get very competitive. An effective way to break down a large story is to slice by development and testing efforts. True or false? Don't say, don't say the answer, <laughs> <laughs> unless you don't want to win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, let's see. All right. We have 16 correct answers and five incorrect answers. So we don't want to break down by development and testing efforts because that, again, is still more of a horizontal slice. If you've only done the development and you haven't done the testing, you haven't fully <coughs> delivered the value to that story. So you want to make your story small enough using vertical slicing so that you can get all of the development, all of the testing, everything to a true definition of done that you have a potentially shippable increment, right? Which is one of your the artifacts in Scrum. So a uh, little bit of a tricky question there, but uh, we have a, have a good majority. All right, next one. So KK in the lead with 944 points. Who's KK? Anybody want to own up? All right, very good in the back. Okay, let's see who can catch up to her. All right. A well-structured story follows the INVEST criteria. The INV in INVEST stands for? Read carefully. Had to make it a little hard. <laughs> All right. I think we just had a couple people that probably clicked too fast, maybe. Um, but yes, so the answer is independent, negotiable, and valuable. Those are the first three letters in invest. <laughs> and now we have Hirsch in the lead with, all, with 1,900 and some points. KK, falling fast. <laughs> OK, a well-structured story follows the invest criteria. The EST stands for what? Again, read carefully. Oh, everybody's getting the hang of it now. Okay, very good. I don't have to explain that one. Hirsch, still in the lead. KK, holding. <laughs> we have Nick, Katie, and LL Cool J. Oh, boy. Okay, next question. Oops, I don't want that. The advantages of story slicing include all of the following except... trick questions. All right, well, we got a good majority there. So it was a little bit, I'm trying to make it a little bit, you have to have some competition here. You can't make the questions too easy. So um, the reason why this is false is because the team owns the story, right? The product owner does not own the story by themselves. When you have a story that follows the invest criteria and we talked about it being estimable, meaning that the whole team owns it. The whole team understands it. It's vertically sliced, and so it includes the development, it includes the testing, and everyone can contribute to that story, so the team owns that story. So again, uh, just trying to keep everybody on their toes a bit. Hirsch still in the lead. Oh, KK, what happened? <laughs> so we, get, we have to make a comeback. Okay, now, I had to throw in a question that I didn't really talk about in my lecture just to keep things interesting. The Pareto Principle states that, let's see how much we can infer here. I threw this in on purpose. <laughs> 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 
Okay, once again, we have a good majority. So if anyone's heard of the 80-20 rule, I didn't actually talk about this in, um, in the lecture part, um, kind of on purpose, because I just wanted to see you know, what people could infer here. But the whole idea is the 80-20 rule is that 80% of the value of the story comes from 20% of the product features. And so as we saw, when we take and we vertically slice things, and we just focus on delivering a little bit at a time, we start to realize what we absolutely need and what we don't need. And so we can start to whittle away that backlog and remove the things that we don't need. All right, Hirsch, wow, holding strong. Who's Hirsch? Anybody want to own up to that? Oh, Hirsch in the back, okay. It's like the back row competition over here a little bit. All right, KK's off the board. All right, all of the following are story slicing patterns except I'm going to turn the music on for a little bit just to make it, it's too quiet in here. Awesome. Okay. I was really hoping we were going to get, get a, get a full, uh, full correct answer on that. Excellent job. All right. Hirsch again. All right. As a general rule, only slice a story once. Breaking stories down too small is inefficient. I'll turn the music off for you. Save you some pain. It does put a lot of extra pressure on though when the music's there, kind of, doesn't it? It's like it's almost stressful in a way. Okay, we have, we have a good majority there. So what we were talking about before was um, I had the slide up about the fractions in grade school and the, the Russian stacking dolls. And so the idea is that you don't have to just break something down once and assume, oh, well, I, I, I broke it down from here, so I'm done. You know, you're always wanting to try to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. All right. Hirsch, me, L, Cool J, KDM, and Ramesh. Question eight. Creating stories to view a report by daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly sales uses the pattern of what? If I so intense, wow. All right. Also, okay, so variations in data. So, so I tend to, think of variations in data is, is a great one for reporting. Whenever you're trying to build out reports, you can always find ways to use the variations in data pattern. You may want to show something in a line graph and a pie chart and a table and so forth. Well, just do one for right now and make sure that that data is actually displaying properly and pulling back from the database and you're getting the results that you thought before you try to build out you know, this elaborate UI, for instance. So again, don't get too hung up if you answered a different one. Um, because maybe you looked at it and said, well, it would be a lot easier to do it yearly than to do daily for your particular situation. So maybe it is simple complex for whatever. So it all depends on your situations, but this is a more general example. All right, it doesn't look like Hirsch is going anywhere, guys. All right, creating a story to optimize system response time uses the pattern Okay, well, we still have a good majority here. So this will be like uh, the performance that we talked about, the logging, some of those system qualities that we talked about is, as one of the patterns. Um, looks like we had answers on all of them a little bit. And so, again, given whatever your situation is at your organization, one of those other patterns might truly make sense. Um, from a generic example perspective, I was looking for system qualities in this case. Okay. Hirsch, invincible. Last question, folks. You should never use the UI to drive story slicing. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at this. <laughs> I don't know whether that was um, not knowing the answer or whether it was just too quick on the click, but 
Um, that was one of the, I had a slide up here with the guy with the magnifying glass, and that was one of the clues that we talked about, uh, was that you can sometimes use mock-ups that you receive, and they might give you clues into using patterns to slice stories. Maybe the tabs themselves could be different patterns, or the buttons, or, or what have you. So, all right, the final results are Hirsch, KDM, and LL Cool J. Excellent job. All right, and you now have played Kahoot. You are now, like, you know, amongst all of the, the fifth graders out there in the world, so. <laughs> okay, so um, let me just jump back really quick. I know we're, whoops, I don't want to do that. Hold on one second. All right, and then. <laughs> um, See if it works. Okay, so I think that based on what I've seen here tonight, you guys are all able to story slice like a boss. So congratulations. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming out uh, and taking the time to be here and um, for being so participatory. Um, I do have one final request. Uh, I do have a, some slides, some um, links here. Uh, that I can certainly like email out. I'm probably going to put this on SlideShare, so I'll, I'll get in touch with the folks that organize this event and figure out a way to get that information to you. Um, just uh, a little bit about applied frameworks. Uh, as I said, we're a management consulting firm. We help organizations at all different stages. We do a lot of product management and you know help folks through their software development life cycles. We do a lot of training, and really the main reason I wanted to um, mention this slide is that for folks in the room who have their uh, CSM or their CSPO and they're looking to go to that next level, we have this awesome online tool to be able to earn your advanced CSPO, your advanced uh, Scrum Master certification, and then ultimately your CSP. So I encourage you to go ahead and check that out. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'm available afterwards to answer any questions that you have about story slicing. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my business cards are out by the pizza, so you can find me on, on um, LinkedIn. Um, I'm Coach Peremsky on Twitter. And this is an Agile meetup, so I do have one final request because really it wouldn't be an Agile meetup if we didn't do some sort of a retrospective. So my final request for you as, uh, as we depart this evening is if we could do a quick retrospective, and it's going to be very easy. You can make it anonymous too. So what I need you to do, we're going to do the perfection retro. So I just need you to take a sticky note, and on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the best, write down the number that you would give this session. If your chairs were uncomfortable, please don't include that in your evaluation. I'd rather you focus it on, on the, the content itself. I'm always looking to improve. So what I need you to do is write the number, and then just stick it on the back of the wall as you're leaving. But whatever number you wrote, if you gave it a 6, jot down a couple things that would have made it a 10 for you. And that's why we call this the perfection retro. So with that, I thank you again. Um, you've all been great. And I look forward to hopefully hearing from you. I keep in touch on LinkedIn and so forth. And again, I'll hang out afterwards if you have any questions. <laughs>